Just ever been so in love? Remember when you first fell in love? First person you fell in love with? All you can think about all the time was that person that you fell in love with. That, that wasn't anything special, but I just love that person. You didn't know why, you just loved them. And you didn't want to be away from them. You didn't want you wanted to be with them all the time. You cared for them. You worried about them. You worried what they were doing, if they loved you just as much. He's calling them all the time, then they get frustrated with you. They say, boy, I wish you'd leave me alone. <laughs> Trust me, I love you. Then a day comes where you've been with each other for a while and you decide to get married. Oh, boy, then the true test of love starts to show, don't it? <laughs> You're awful quick to giggle on that. But you know, marriage, marriage is, a, is, a, is a, it's a beautiful thing because marriage was instituted to us because we're, we're promised we, we've got another marriage coming. We're the bride of Christ. We as the church, those that are saved by Jesus Christ, those that have accepted Christ into their heart, the church, by faith, you know, when Christ asked Peter, Whom say ye that I am? Peter said, Thou art the Christ. And, God, and Christ said, On this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He knew that Jesus Christ was who, the Son of God. He knew that He was the Christ. Christ told him, He said, Upon this rock, upon that faith that He had to know, because God revealed that to him. He knew through that faith that He was the one. He was the one. Peter told Christ, he said, I will die for you. He said, I will die for you. When Christ came in and washed the disciples, and washed the disciples' feet, Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. I said, boy, you better sit down because you don't know what you do. See, but he knew that love. He loved him. He loved Christ. And Christ loved us enough that He died for us. I was telling Brother Kent while I go watch the little movie last night, and uh, it's old Jackie Chan. He told the told the old fella. He said, "When you don't have anyone worth dying for, there's no point in living." I said, "Wow." That's the only thing I got out of the whole movie, but it was a good statement. It was true, because Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. When we were sinners, we crucified Him. We drove the nails in His hands. We put the crown of thorns upon His head. We hung Him. We mocked Him. We yelled, crucify Him, crucify Him. And He loved us anyway. And He died for us. Not only did He die, but He rose again from the dead. That we could have newness of life. That we could live our lives through Him. If y'all would this morning, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I didn't know where God was going with this, and I don't know why He had it on me this morning, but here we are. And this is what we do. We trust the Lord, thy God, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're going to believe in His words, and we're going to hear His words today. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 1. This is talking about marriage. It says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Verse 2 says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. 
You hear that? Let the husband render unto his wife due benevolence. And likewise the wife unto the husband. Do benevolence. Benevolence is to be well-minded one towards another. Benevolence is to be in agreement one with another. Is to have good intentions or good will. Benevolence is conjugal, which are things pertaining to marriage. Kindness. Kindness. Husband, be benevolent. Give due benevolence. And likewise, the wife. Why do we argue? Why do we have fight? Because we don't agree on everything. We don't always have the same views. We don't always have the same ideas. We don't always see things the same way. Well, that's where that goodwill comes in. Sometimes one has to submit to the other one a little bit till you can come to one in agreement on, the pro on whatever it is that's at hand. Your beliefs, your faith, your children, your house, the things you do in your life, the troubles that you face, you come together and you start talking with each other. Do benevolence. Honey, how was your day? How was your day? Mine was terrible. Terrible, terrible. Well, tell me about it. No matter how bad your day was, we're supposed to, according to the Bible, we're supposed to put others before ourselves. And if we do that, if we start with our spouses because this marriage on this earth is just that. It's here. There's no marriage in heaven. We've got a wedding supper one day that we're going to attend and we're going to sit at. We've got a bridegroom that's preparing a place for us right now. He is preparing a place for His church, for His bride. For His bride. I got to thinking about this as I was reading it kind of sidetracked me because it's kind of silly. Could you imagine sitting at the, bride, at the wedding supper when Christ is coming around serving you. When He's serving you. He should have known I didn't like that. I don't like this bread. Could you imagine? Would you say that to Jesus Christ? Would you think that in your heart? Or would you go in with intentions? I don't care what He brings to this table. I'm going to love it because I love Him. Because I love Him. And the only reason I can love Him is because He first loved me. You see, that's where we mess up here on this earth. We tend to think more about what we want and our desires in a relationship more so than we think about the one that's trying to please us in the relationship. When somebody goes out of, your, out of their way to do for you, do you see what they do? Jesus Christ, He went out of His way. Man, He went way out of His way. At any time, He could have called legions of angels to deliver Him and take Him back home. Father, I ain't dying for these hypocrites. I ain't dying for this sinful bunch of people. But no, He didn't. He took it. He took the beating. He took the scourge. And He stood boldly in the synagogues proclaiming the truth. He called out the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He told them, you hypocrites. You leading these people astray. They were constantly questioning Him, but yet He stood true to His Father which is in heaven. He stood true to the Word of God. He gave us the Word so that we could have something to hold true to if we just take it and read it and inscribe it on our hearts and live it. Love one another. Put others before yourself. Even in a relationship, especially in a marriage. Verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. says, The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, 
but the why. They're subjective to one another. I don't have power over my own body, but my wife does. Yeah, and I got power over her. That's what he's saying. We have power over each other. We're at one. We're at one. We come together as one. What Christ say? I and my Father are one. See, we are one. We're one with Christ. Verse 5 says, Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time. That means don't act treacherously with one another. Don't be cunningly devising things. I'll get him. I'll get him. I'll show him. You go bleach his brand new work breaches or something. That's devisingly. That's defrauding one another. You, you, you're putting one another out. You start causing tension in a relationship. When that tension starts arising in a relationship, when you start having ill thoughts about your mate, those that you stood before God and said, I do, till death do us part, I do. When you start having feelings against those people and you start thinking about defrauding those people, the Bible says, except it be for a time, consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Defraud ye not one another except it be with consent for a time. So sometimes you need a little me time. Sometimes you need to, to step back for a minute. You don't need time to step back and go hang out with your girlfriends and put yourselves in places to where you're going to be tempted the guys don't need time away from the wife so that they can go hang out in the bars and get drunk, go be with their buddies and talk bad about their wives. We need time apart for prayer and fasting. Because if you truly love somebody, if you truly want things to work, you have to pray. You Sometimes you have to fast. Sometimes you got to make that sacrifice to handle the relationship, to get things in order. Christ said in Matthew 17 and 20, For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. It goes on to say that this type going forth without prayer and fasting. See, today's time we have mountains in our lives. We have mountains in our relationship. We have kids. We've got kids playing ball. We've got kids doing this. We've got work. We're trying to balance the husband works, the wife works. We've got bills. we got all this stuff is piling upon us. Yet we don't have any time for ourselves. We don't have anything to do for me or, or us or all we do is run, 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 and we're broke. We don't have any money. Those are mountains. And those mountains cause divisions because one spouse wants to go around the mountain while the other one's trying to go over it. But if we're going to go over that mountain, we need to go over it hand in hand. Or without prayer and fasting, you're going to be stuck. We have to pray that those mountains will be removed, whatever they are. And the only way you can do this, you have to function as a unit. You have to function as one. Marriage ain't a 50-50 relationship. That's 100% both ways. Giving all of yourself to your significant other. It only works one way. Christ gave His all so that we could live through Him. He gave us His Word. He gave us His blood. God breathed the breath of life into us. He gave us His all. He formed us from the dust. He gave us His all. And we are to give our all to each other. Because we can't forget. We ain't even had the wedding supper yet. We haven't made it to the bridegroom yet. We've got to get it right now.
The frogs you not one another except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. You see that? It didn't say it. Figure out, well, I don't want to be. It said come together again that Satan tempt you not and your incontinency, your lack of self-will, your lack of being able to control yourself. You've got to pray that God will reveal your faults to you. God, show me where I'm wrong. Don't be looking at everybody else's fault. Don't be looking at your spouse's fault. Lord, what can I do? What can I do to make this a better relationship? Show me my faults. Show me my faults. You pray for your significant other. But ask God to show you where it is that you need Him. Verse 6 says, But I speak this by permission and not a commandment, Paul said, For I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. It is better to marry than to burn. We were given the institution of marriage to keep from fornication, which is a sin. We live in sinful flesh. That's why Paul's saying it's better to marry than to burn. He said it's better to marry than to burn. That's why it's so important now that, you know, children refrain from these things because my kids are having sex at such an early age. That's fornication. That's fornicating with the world. That's fornication. God looks on it. If you lay with a woman, you're betrothed to that woman. You're hers in God's eyes and anything outside of that is fornication and adultery. See, that's where the world, we've gotten so far out of whack because we've forgotten who our Creator is. We don't want to believe the Bible. We don't want to think, well, we're under grace. We're under grace. We are, thank God. Grace gives us the strength to say no. Grace gives us the strength to say, not for me. Grace gives us the strength to say, I love my wife. Grace gives us the strength to turn our eyes from evil things. Grace gives us the strength to flee youthful lust, that the Bible says. Flee, that means run. See, Paul said, I wish y'all were like I. He, he said he didn't have a wife. He wasn't worried about nothing. He was worried about, he was focused on preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, I wish that you were all as I. Because it was his love, Jesus Christ. He said, I claim not to have apprehended, but I keep pushing for that mark, that high calling of God. I keep reaching out for God. I, I want to go. I want to be with Jesus. That was his love. That was his focus. And I wish we could all be like Paul, but we're not all created like Paul. God give us a way through this marriage to demonstrate His love towards us. Verse 10 says, And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. I was sitting there watching that show the other night. Kathy had it on. And married at first sight. I don't know if any of y'all say that. I tried to watch it for a little bit, but that's the silliest thing I've ever seen. These people, these couples, they come in, this people made them up however by their whatever they fill out or whatever. They, they put them together. And they bring them and the first time they see each other is at the altar. Never met them before in their life. They're put together by somebody out there in the world in computer land that looking at statistics and criteria from each one of the mates. And then they say, well, we've got a good couple here. And they come together and they get married. Just like that. Also, they can be on TV. Then it shows them, you know, they're a little standoffish at first and then they go off on their honeymoon and 90% of them are fighting and clawing at one another. And it's 
For what? It makes a mockery of the institution of marriage. Marriage is love. You have to love someone to be married to someone. Christ laid down His life for His church. That's true love. If you're not willing to lay down your life for your loved one, what are you doing in that relationship? <clears throat> and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But unless she depart, let her remain unmarried. Or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest speak I, not to the not not the Lord. This is Paul speaking. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not un under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all the churches. He said, if you've got an unbelieving wife, and you're a believer, you believe in Christ, you're a follower of Christ, but yet your wife's not following Christ. He said, don't put her away. Don't put her away. Maybe through your good conversation and your works, and your temperance and your love of God would sanctify her that she too may be saved. And likewise the wife of an unbelieving husband that through your faith, through your good works, through your conversation, through the things that he sees that you love God and that he comes second to God or she comes second to God that your focus is on God above. Just like God in Israel. You see, the church was brought about. Why? To make Israel jealous. You see, if we focus on God, if we focus our relationships on Him, everything else will fall into place. Those unbelievers, they're going to see your good works and they're going to see your faith to please God. And they're going to understand that they come in second. And they want to follow you. They want to, they want to, they're going to emulate your good works. You see, everybody's so quick today to jump into marriage and jump into divorce because it's fun for a little while because they only see the fleshly things of marriage. When a true marriage starts to grow is when it goes through fire after fire after fire and battle after battle. And you can't and you realize you can't fight every battle on your own, that you've got to fight it with each other. And you've got to put God in the forefront of those battles. Following Him. Following Him. And let Him be the overcomer for you. First Peter chapter three. I hope y'all getting something out of this. First Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. There it is again. Hey, man, how many times we heard, I ain't listening to that story, rascal. My husband's an idiot. He's a slob. He ain't no good. How many times, oh, my wife, she don't clean the house. She don't do this. She don't do that. We're supposed to be in subjection to each other, so if your partner ain't doing it, why ain't you? 
Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. We just talked about that. While they behold your chaste conversations coupled with fear. What is fear? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge of fools, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but because of your fear. Your chaste con won by your conversation of the wise. While they behold your chaste conversations coupled with fear, who's adorning. Let it not be that outward adorning of uh, plating the hair and the wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. A meek and quiet spirit. What Proverbs says, it's better to dwell on a rooftop than in a house with a contentious woman. Same thing goes with the men. I've seen some men that can be contrary old rascals and wives that love them to death and yet just sit there and take it day in and day out because they love the Lord and they love their husband and they abide by the Word of God and they believe unto the end. Men, it's not so much. Men, men ain't that patient. <laughs> but let it be hidden man of the heart in which in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of the meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, verse 5, as the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husband. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do, the we do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, Giving honor, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. That your prayers, you hear that? That your prayers be not hindered. Husbands, give honor unto your wives. Take care of your wives. The Bible says, as the weaker vessel. As the weaker vessel. That's hard today. I seen a woman the other day, son. Woo. She, she was more of a man than I was. But you know, that scares you when you see those things because where are they going? What's the world coming to? The women are taking rule over the men. The men. The women, they rule in the houses. That's, that, that's outside the Bible. Isaiah talks about it. said the women will rule over them. Children are their oppressors. And the women rule over them. Why is that? The men have stepped down from their roles. The husbands don't want to be the man of the house. The wives are working harder than the husbands in a lot of cases. And the men are sitting at home playing video games or knitting, on their, knitting or whatever they do nowadays. It doesn't matter what they do, but you still are the head of the house, man. The men are still over the wife. You treat her like she's gold. Like she's a diamond. Or sapphire. <laughs> <laughs> but in order for a marriage to work, we've got to keep our focus on God. That's the whole point. Keep our focus on God. Putting others before yourself. When trouble times come, instead of parting ways with each other, it's okay to part ways for prayer and fasting, but you've got to talk about the problem and come to a solution because you're at one. You're at one. Y'all turn to Ephesians chapter 5. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to start yeah let's start verse 22 wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord you hear that wives submit yourselves 
unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Think about that for a minute. Submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Do you just want to give the Lord half your time? If you love the Lord, you're going to love your husband. If you love the Lord, you're going to love your wife. Submit yourself to your husband as unto the Lord. Verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And He is the Savior of the body. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Boy, that's, that's deep saying there. That's drowning, that's drowning water. That's over my head. It's saying, wives, submit yourselves unto your husband, even as Christ, Christ is head of the church, your husband's head of you. But see... We don't use that to hold over our wives. Men, we love our wives. Christ died for the church. Would we be willing to die for our wives? Our loved ones? Or for the gospel's sake? Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. He gave Himself for the church. Now could you see, paint a picture here, and it's not a very pretty picture. But you imagine Someone that you dearly love, your wife. And she's out on the street corner shooting needles, taking drugs, fornicating and whoring around, as the Bible calls that whoring. She's a whore. Could you take, paint that picture? A man is desperately in love with his wife and she's fell astray. And this is the condition that he finds her in. And as he's there grabbing her in his arms, trying to help her and save her, and the world's trying to pull her out of the grasp of his arms, and, and he puts himself between her and the world and gives his life at that very moment for the fact that she could live. Can you see that? Because that's what Christ done for us. We were whoring around with the world. We, we were dead in our sins. Worshiping false gods. Worshiping the gods of ourselves. Not thinking about God. We didn't care about Jesus. This has all been in our time. From the time of our conception because we are all born unclean things. This is in our life the things that we've done. The sins that we've committed in our lives. With Christ sitting at the right hand of God looking down. Thanking Lord I died for them too. I died for them too. Just give them one more shot. Do we call out and do we confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior? Do so we cry out and say Lord God save me? He's there to take us into His own. That's true love. That's what a marriage is supposed to be. I'm going to read y'all something real quick. Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. I'm going to start verse 1. It says, Sing, O barren, and thou didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, that thou, excuse me, 
that thou that didst not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. What's he saying? More are the children of the desolate than the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not. Lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded. For thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember thy, the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Verse 5 says, For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is His name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall He be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. Verse 7 says, For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. He said, My kindness will never depart. Although your wombs have been bared, although you've forsaken me, you, you've created false images, you've created false gods, I've cast you off for a little while. But I will come back. I will come and get you. He said, I will receive you unto myself. He's talking to Israel here. Christ the same way. He's talking to the church. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I love you. Draw nigh to me, he said. Draw nigh to God. He wants you to love him. He wants to love you. He gave his life for you. He gave us his word that we could abide by, that we would know his love and that we could share that love. And to have to feel that love, to know that love, you have to know God. And if you haven't got that intimate relationship with God, how are you going to have an intimate relationship with the wife or the husband that He's given you? Back in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. He's going to cleanse it and sanctify that marriage by the washing of water by the Word. Why? That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, that's, that it should be holy and without blemish. Your relationship should be holy and without blemish. You focus your marriage on God, then each other, then your children, then everything else. Put God first. Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be like Paul. We're trying to apprehend. We're trying to draw close to God. We're trying to get to that point. We're going to be His bride. The bride of Christ. We need to focus on loving each other now. It goes way beyond marriage. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy neighbors. That's loving everybody. It ain't always telling them what they want to hear, but loving them, chastising them, telling them the truth. That hell is real. Eternity is for real. Where do you want to spend it? That's a decision that you've got to make in this life. When we make a decision to marry someone, we've made a decision to spend the rest of our lives with that person. 
When we make a decision to accept Jesus Christ into our life, we've made a decision to let that person be the head of our life. We're giving everything that we've got to Him. And we ought to do the same for each other. We ought to be loving one another. Love your husbands. Love your wives. Verse 28 says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Love your wife even as yourself. Wife, reverence your husband, because if you reverence your husband, he's going to love you more than you could ever imagine. It's time we start loving one another. If there's problems in a relationship, start focusing on God instead of the problem. Pray about it. Because we have to get our personal relationship right with God and then right with each other so that we can pray and He can hear us. We read that earlier. So that our prayers may be heard. Our prayers. We too, husbands and wives, become one flesh. Those that aren't married here in this flesh, we got a husband, his name is God. The Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We are part of the same body. The body of Christ. Colossians 3 and 18 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. We are to be loving each other as it is fit unto the Lord. God is looking. God is calling. God is crying out saying, Get it right. Get it right. You know, the divorce was instituted for one thing. When a fornicating woman or a fornicating husband. When you got want somebody that cheats on you, you got a fornicator in your marriage, and the marriage there's fornication, you can depart from those. You can depart from those. God wrote Israel a bill of divorcement. That bill of divorcement, the divorcement set divorce papers were written up to relieve that person. That one, to tell everybody that they were, they were I done away with them because of my hard-heartedness. Because I couldn't make it happen. Because I, I was too selfish to show them how much I, I loved them. That's why I had to write a bill of divorce. She didn't do nothing wrong. So therefore, I had to write a bill of divorce. That's what the divorce is. The fornicating, the unbelieving, the Bible said if they decide to leave, let them go. Let them go, but the divorce is there to clear the one that has been let go because of our hard-heartedness. That's what Christ says. Because of your hardness of your hearts, we have this divorce. We, there's a divorce. Is what the Bible says. So you see, we just don't get a divorce for anything. That divorce clears the one that has been let go. That's the one that clears their paper. That clears their slate. But you know, when we have to write a bill of divorcement, it's because of the hardness of our heart. Because we didn't give 100% and we didn't want to make it work. Because we didn't want to make it work. We got to make it work. In the church, in our lives, and in our relationship with God. We got to get it right and we got to make it work. And the only way we can make it work is seek Him. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We've got to seek God first in everything that we do. Doesn't mean we're not going to stumble and not going to fall on our faces, 
But guess what? When God's give you a help meet there, and you two are one, you're both focused on God, you can lift each other up. You can stay warm. A three-fold cord is hard to be, can't be broken. And when you got a good husband, a good wife, and you both following God, you're going to go far. So love your neighbors, love your husbands, love your wives. There ain't no problem you can't work through. But put God first in your life. That's all it boils down to. Keep God first. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not into thine own understanding. Believe in Him. Anybody have anything to add? Any questions? I'm going to hush. I ain't no marriage counselor. <laughs>